being there. Um, so by all means, um, if you have any questions as we go through or any issues, raise those in the chat. Um, I'm Sarah Jones from the Digital Curation Centre. Um, and the other person you can see here is Ellen uh, from Dance. Don't know if you want to introduce yourself, Ellen. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm from Dance, as you say, and I work uh, on open air, mainly on the uh, RDM uh, training uh, work package and also uh, involved in other projects such as EUDAT, uh, EOSC now, and uh, uh, well, we've worked together, uh, at Dans, we've worked together with Marjan Grootveld and Eliane Frankhausen, and who are not present here, and also Emily Hermans from Udent, who is now also a moderator, so just to mention. Excellent. Okay, so what we're going to do, um, we're going to speak for probably around 40 minutes. Um, I'll give you an introduction to the survey and some of the highlight findings, and then Ellen will dig into more detail on what we found. Um, and then uh, what we'll do, we'll come to the recommendations and, and kind of next steps from this. So to give you a bit of background to the survey, this was conducted by Open Air, which is a project that, that both Ellen and myself are involved in and also the Fair Data Expert Group, and I'm here kind of representing the two of those. And we ran the survey over last summer, so between May and July last year, and it was really intended to help the EC improve and iterate its guidance and approach to, to DMPs. We'd had some questions raised on open air webinars um, about how people could give feedback to the EC, and one of the tasks of the Fair Data Expert Group is to collate and to help evaluate um, the DMP template and to help them develop discipline-specific guidelines. So what we did in the survey, we asked about general attitudes towards data management plans and a number of specific questions around the Horizon 2020 template and the support that people felt was needed. And we had a lot of help to, to circulate that survey. Lots of e-infrastructure projects like UDAT and Foster and others helped us distribute it, and also groups like LIBA and the Research Data Alliance. And partway through the survey, we realized that we were getting more research support responses rather than researchers. So we also worked with the European Commission's project officers to specifically target um, researchers with active projects and to work through year and Eurodoc, which are early career researcher networks. And that was to help people um, to, to help get more responses. Overall, we received 289 responses, and around half of those were from researchers, and 60% of people identified themselves as research support. So they could select the two categories if, if desired. All of the results, um, as well as this infographic, are available already on Zenodo. Um, and I just wanted to flag this as a kind of quick overview of the findings. What I'll do is give you a couple of highlights from this, and then Ellen will talk through more detailed results. So overall, there was a positive response to the data management plans. 60% uh, of people thought that it was a positive experience, even if they had had some reservations. So you can see in this first quote that people had felt it looked like an administrative exercise, but actually when they went through that process of creating the plan, they found that it made them reflect on the best format for the data or how to make them available, and they found value in, in that process. There were nonetheless some people who, who felt it was a negative experience overall, that was just 16%. And 24% of respondents here had chosen not applicable. And it's not 100% clear what they mean there, but I am taking it as they're kind of sitting on the fence. So they, there are some positive aspects, but also some negative ones. And you can see uh, we had a number of responses like this quote at the bottom here, where there were some things they thought were helpful, like it, it making them reflect on potential issues. But they also had some frustrations. So sometimes there were comments like the, the template was too long and cumbersome, or some of the questions were too specific or, or too vague. Overall, there was a good understanding of FAIR. We asked um, participants to respond to a series of statements. And this statement that I don't understand what FAIR means was the one that provoked the, the kind of strongest reaction. People really disagreed with that. So I think the, the basic principle of FAIR is really well understood and is something that people appreciate. 
but some of the terminology poses difficulties and I think things like terms like interoperability in particular when people are thinking about how to implement that um, they get more confused so what we found was that the language at the moment is provided posing a little bit of a barrier and there were 40 terms overall that respondents mentioned were unclear to them and you can see that interoperability is the kind of primary term there that came out as an issue the other terms that pose problems um, in particular were things like metadata and ontologies and controlled vocabularies um, and in this quote you can see people are saying it's, it's more of the ICT type of jargon that people are having issues with so I think it's really important that there's support on the ground to help people understand the requirements and how to implement them. And in the second quote, you can see that one of the participants mentioned that they'd got help from the Swedish National Data Service. And without that, they wouldn't have really been able to finish the DMP because they just wouldn't have understood or been able to clarify what the questions meant. So I think there's a key role for both the ECs funded projects but also for data centers and for the kind of institutional support provision. The template structure was also found to be problematic and this came out across a number of questions. People found that there was quite a lot of overlap between you know, the different elements of FAIR, the findability, accessibility, interoperability and reuse. Um, and this meant that certain questions were repeated or sim very similar questions. So things like metadata came up in all of the different sections. And it also meant that the ordering wasn't always that logical with the questions. So people were, were being asked to explain how they were going to make their data findable before they were talking about the repositories that they were going to use. So potentially things could you know, already be answered in one question and then they'd find another question asking the same kind of thing. People also mentioned that some of the questions were a little bit precise and that they would prefer more drop down options and examples. And, and that's one of the themes you'll see come out as, as Ellen talks. We also asked the users to prioritize um, what kind of support they would like. And we gave them 10 options on a kind of um, on a matrix and they listed their top five priorities. And what you see here is the weighted scores. And you can see the, the kind of top priorities are really about having more tailored um, guidance that's pertinent to that researcher's context. So the, the top answer was suggesting relevant standards for their particular field and data type. And you can see the fifth one down is about recommending repositories that they can use. And then the others that, that came up at the top here were about having more examples or suggested answers, more drop down options and, and discipline specific guidance. So really what the priority at the moment is for users is, is having kind of more tailored support. There were also some options about kind of data exchange across different systems. So connecting up different research tools and maybe pulling information in. So you could pre-fill aspects of the DMP or push information out to share with services, either at an institutional level or, or with data centers. These were of a lesser concern to people at the moment, um, although obviously some people did choose those as their priorities too. So drawing out all of the results from the survey, um, we pulled out seven recommendations, and these are what we'll return to at the end and talk you through um, in detail. But for the moment, I'll hand over to Ellen, who will go into more of the specific questions and the, the survey results. Yes, thank you. So um, I will go through a number of other uh, questions and answers of the survey, and then uh, we will return to the recommendations with Sarah again. Um, so that's why I move on to the next slide. So um, at the top of the slide, you can see that uh, this is about question four. That's why it's between brackets. Um, experience with the DMP uh, template. This was uh, a question that um, uh, respondents could were asked to enter to what extent the statements that were um, uh, that, that are also on this slide represent their experiences at the DMP template. Originally, this was a five-point scale, but uh, we summarized it in the report. So um, 
Another thing that uh, I should mention is that questions could be skipped by the respondents, and this one was only answered by 60%, so 173 of the in total 289. Um, but you can see in this table that the DMP tem template is considered by most respondents uh, to this question as a very useful template. 105 have said they agreed it is a very useful template, so it's rather positive, I think. Most of the respond, uh, respondents to this question also agree that there is a clear structure and the questions are grouped into helpful categories. There's also agreement with the level of guidance and provided contextual information. Now, as mentioned before, the concept of fair, fair that is at the bottom seems clear to the majority of respondents, although uh, responses to other questions such as questions five to eight make clear that uh, these are questions about uh, implementing the FAIR data principles. As mentioned, language seems to be a barrier. Many uh, respondents would, uh, would like to have more drop-down uh, instead of free text answers, um, as you uh, can see. And taking the average, the number of questions seems to be perceived all right. And, uh, uh, um, not the last one, but the one before. Um, questions might be perceived as irrelevant, but more respondents disagree on that point. Let's see the next question. Yeah. So the question seven uh, was about guidance, and uh, the respondents could uh, note any guidance that is missing or could be improved. But well, this uh, question was answered in comments by 81 respondents, that is 28% uh, of all the respondents. Naturally, only people who would, would like to point out missing guidance uh, would answer this question. So the word cloud gives an impression of the answers given by the respondents to this question. Uh, it is clear from the answers to this question in question six on confusing and inconsistent and redundant terminology that was also mentioned earlier in the webinar, that guidance could be improved by providing more examples of DMPs, repositories, um, how to improve interoperability, cost estimation, and more uh, subject-specific and specialized guidelines. The guidance mentioned by some uh, to be too complicated and technical, and by others it could be made less vague and less generic. People asked also to provide information on where to find more specialized guidelines. Yes, we still not work fluently. Uh, question eight uh, was about coverage. Uh, respondents could note any topic, topics that are missing. So this one is not about guidance, but topics that are missing or ones that should be removed in the DMP template. In this case, 15%, only 42 of the 289 respondents indicated missing topics. And the topics that were mentioned uh, are uh, listed here, uh, uh, were listed as uh, missing topics. But these aren't currently completely missing in the template, except, um, except for software. So uh, what was meant was, was, what is a good repository for software? What are the possibilities for long-term software storage in terms of metadata and licensing? Well, as most topics are, not, uh, are to some extent already in the template, the comments are mostly about the level of detail people expected per area. This can also be seen um, in, the, in the comment. It also depends on the project that you are working on. So there's a quote here on the slide. I think this would probably vary according to individual projects. It's possible that a one-size-fits-all approach is not practical. Yeah, question nine was about uh, the process. So um, the uh, participants could note any issues they encountered following the EC guidelines, for example, with knowing when a DMP is due, how it will be reviewed, 
how to include costs, and so on. Now, first of all, again, as you can see, the respondents entered only uh, 63 issues in total, and 19 respondents took the opportunity to say they encountered no issues. But of the 289 respondents, 75% uh, skipped the questions, skipped, skipped this question, and did not enter any issues. So a minority entered issues, and the issues that are uh, mentioned here uh, in the table is about cost, uh, uh, clear guidance, and clear requirements. The issues that stand out here, we think, are about the process of updating a DMP during a project, what should be provided, and when, and how do you do this technically, understanding how DMPs are reviewed, by what standards and by whom, and if the DMPs will be monitored later on. Also mentioned is the issue of estimate, estimating and including associated costs what costs are uh, eligible. Now, the, about uh, reviewing, uh, there's a quote there that says, processes around the assessment of the content are unclear to me. And the other quote, as stated before, clarification of what is an uh, eligible cost regarding uh, research data management is urgently needed for researchers and also for RDM support teams at the universities. Sorry. Now, the tenth question, um, uh, respondents could, uh, could give other issues or provide other suggestions. And here, uh, around 85% of the respondents skipped this question. So there's still 48 people left who entered issues that are shown here. And again, some of those uh, said they had no issues or suggestions, and the two big topics that, are, that stand out from the one who gave uh, suggestions are uh, the need for more guidance and a clearer structure of the template. And guidance uh, is seen as can be provided by sharing examples of good DMPs or provide discipline-specific guidance. These are all uh, um, results that come out of comments that people gave. And with regard to improving the structure of the template, it was suggested to create a shorter template or uh, provide checkboxes to tick and also, uh, um, as can be uh, seen by the quote here, is which part should be set up already in the beginning, what can be added later. It would be helpful to indicate needed and nice to have for the starting point or for different stages. Now, uh, the next uh, one is not about uh, question 11, but about question uh, 12, because 11 is already mentioned early in the webinar. And 12 is about DMP publishing. Lots of people have answered this question, uh, although not all, but uh, 134, and almost half of the total number of the respondents provided an answer uh, to the question, would you openly publish your DMP? And the outcome of this question shows a clear willingness to share DMPs that could be example DMPs for others, we think. So 48% of the answers were yes, without any comment. And around 20 people said yes, but only if these uh, of their requirements met, such as confidentiality or only after a project finished. The confidentiality was also a showstopper for some uh, uh, op uh, open DMPs probably projects where not too much of the nature of the data uh, should uh, be revealed or brings partners into in danger, as mentioned here. Now, ah, yeah, we have one more about suggestions. <laughs> now, what are the main uh, suggestions you would give to the European Commission about its approach to DMPs in the open data pilot? That was question. Uh, 14. It was answered by a quarter of the respondents, and a word cloud of the responses are shown here. We can recognize many of the topics that uh, are mentioned uh, before, such as the need for example DMPs, 
But a new one here is uh, to involve researchers and institutions. And that's also um, mentioned in uh, some of the comments. And uh, shown here, talk to researchers and ask them whether the DMP requirements are realistic. Involve researchers when developing disciplinary guidance. And another one is focus on technical exchange formats for these plans. So they can be shared between tools, that is, make the plans themselves fair. I think that's a fair point as well. Now, um, the last part of um, last uh, uh, questions are about providing feedback and reviewing DMPs. Um, the question 15 was, have you given feedback to other DMP writers on their draft DMP? Now, half of the respondents have answered this question, and of these, most said no. Around 50 respondents ended yes and followed up with answering uh, the next question, which was question, question 16, on the kind of feedback. And as you can see, most of these um, uh, responses were spread out until uh, over these uh, multiple choice options that we gave. And not much other. I think that's uh, we covered most there. Then in uh, question 18, the next uh, slide, it's about reviewing. There was also a question 17, which is not shown here, and it was asked how supporting researchers with an uh, Horizon 2020 DMP differed from assisting on DMPs from other funders. Now, to that question, 45 people responded that they felt the uh, Horizon 2020 template took longer than other templates. Now, on this slide, you can see um, on the right-hand side the results from our survey um, on the Horizon 2020 template. And on the left side, you can see the results uh, from a local research in the Netherlands by uh, LCRDM. And the same question was asked there. And uh, as you can see, um, it might uh, be that the review pro process to have taken uh, less time uh, for other DMPs than the Horizon 2020 DMPs. Or we cannot say uh, a lot about it, of course, because only a few people have answered this question in both cases. So um, I can hand over now to Sarah again for um, to spend a little bit more attention to the recommendations. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Ellen. So, so what we wanted to do to close is to work through the recommendations that we, we listed, those seven, and I'll talk through the specifics that we've kind of suggested in the report under each of those, really to think about what hopefully the EC or, or others can aspire to. So the, the first recommendation was about clarifying the EC's requirements for data management plans. There were quite a lot of comments that came out throughout the report where people had you know, either had misconceptions or had been misadvised or had some confusion over exactly what was required. So we recommended that the EC collates all their data related and DMP guidelines into a single document. They have one main document, the one that's linked at the bottom here, which is the Fair Data Management Guidelines. But there's also um, guidance in other documents like the general open access guidelines that's not within there. So at the moment, there's quite a few places for, for researchers to look. So we suggested bringing that together and also making announcements as these guidelines change because people aren't always aware that it's been updated and that there might be new things to adhere to. We also suggested being more explicit about when a DMP is and isn't required. I mentioned um, right at the outset that 16% of respondents had said, you know, they, they didn't see the point in the DMP process. And some of the comments related to those kind of no answer, the, the negative answers were flagging things that were actually genuine concerns. They were saying that they didn't have any data, that they didn't see why they had to create a DMP. And in those circumstances, they wouldn't need to. So I think actually some of those issues that are encountered could actually be, be fixed by just some more guidelines and being a bit more explicit about when people don't need to create a DMP. 
And there are also some questions about exactly what set of questions should be answered. So within the guidelines we've linked to here, there's a, a big set of questions and then there's a table at the end with a slightly different version of those questions and people were wondering exactly which ones to respond to. And they'd also asked for um, a docx version, an actual template to fill in, as well as supporting the online tools that are in place. So this is the kind of things we've said around clarifying those requirements. As I mentioned at the outset, there were also some general points made about the template structure and people finding that questions were being repeated or that the ordering was a bit confusing. So we've suggested regrouping the questions according to key activities. So the fair concept should definitely remain within that, but we're not sure that it's the way to structure the template. So potentially asking people about their data creation, about concepts like metadata or their plans for sharing altogether. And because there are so many questions within the template, I think people often feel overwhelmed at that six month point. So we'd suggest kind of identifying what questions are the primary ones, what, what do the Commission really want answered initially, and what potentially are secondary questions that could be fleshed out as the project goes on, or could even be skipped if they're not relevant to the project. So there are some questions, for example, about data access committees, which maybe aren't relevant if the project isn't creating sensitive data. So some grouping that enabled a better pathway through would, would be better. We'd also suggested including more yes, no questions or drop down options or having integrations between tools so you could pull in lists of repositories or, or other kind of registry information so researchers can select relevant options. And because the EC obviously is evaluating DMPs and looking at, at the practice that's going on, we suggested identifying questions that will support their evaluation and formulating those in a more structured way so they can have automated compliance checks in future. In terms of the, the DMP content and terminology, as I flagged, the language is a bit of a barrier at the moment. So we've suggested simplifying the terminology where possible or where, where certain terms, technical terms need to be used provide a glossary to assist researchers in understanding those. And in particular, there was a big call for example answers, but I think it's really useful to provide example answers around those problematic questions. So the ones around interoperability, for example. So it helps researchers understand the terms and see them applied in context in their research area. In terms of the DMP content, we'd suggest shortening the number of questions or, or as we mentioned earlier, having some kind of prioritisation about which are the primary questions and, and which are more optional. And so having some kind of hierarchy or routing through so it's easier for, for projects to complete their DMP and for it to be that evolving document as, as suggested by the EC guidelines. At the moment, because all the questions are presented at the outset. I think a lot of projects feel that they have to answer everything and, and get a little bit overwhelmed at the start because it seems too, too much detail at that six month stage. There was a big call for discipline specific guidelines. Um, so this is something that I think really should be added to, to enhance the template and, and the guidance that's offered. And people also asked for example answers and the more that those can be tailored to the specific disciplines and pick up on good practice in each domain, the, the better. And again, um, both Ellen and I flagged the kind of request for drop down options. Again, if these can be tailored to the practice in different disciplines, that, that would be better. And we suggest that the EC builds on existing work going on in this area. We'll flag some, some work uh, or later on, um, but there's things like the Science Europe domain protocols that, that could be built on and obviously they could collaborate with discipline specific data centres and, and other, other groups like learned societies. There's already um, a lot of Horizon 2020 DMPs being published. Um, so over half of the participants said that they'd published their DMP and many are, are already available on the web. And we think it's, it's worthwhile for the EC to build on that traction to, to encourage projects to publish their, their data management plans and also to collate those together so that the most information can be used um, 
So offering a registry service and ideally providing a library of approved examples. I know this, this can be contentious sometimes, funders don't want to, to say this is a, a good DMP because they don't want it to be copied. But there, there was quite a lot of um, points of confusion and people looking for good practice examples. So I think it would be beneficial to offer those. And again, there's already work going on in this area. The EC has a number of external reviewers for DMPs. We've got all the infrastructure projects that they support um, that could help with this. And LIBA, um, I saw the RDM working group has been trying to develop a, a registry of DMPs and through the LIBA, the library community, um, to do reviews to show what is a good example. Costs came out um, in a number of questions as, as an issue. So we really recommend including RDM costs in the grant applications. At the moment, the timing isn't that beneficial because people are asked about their costs within the data management plan, which is first developed at month six of the project. And obviously by then it's too late to include additional costs in the proposal. Um, so we suggest raising a few questions or alerts at the grant proposal stage. And the respondents to the survey really wanted a lot more worked examples so they know what an eligible cost is and how that should be added into the proposal. And I just put this, this one quote from one of the respondents on this slide just to show the level of detail people are looking for. They have quite a lot of questions about exactly what is eligible and, and how to cost that in. And obviously it's really useful to brief reviewers on what is eligible as well and also what should be expected. So if costs aren't written into a proposal, that's something that's flagged as a potential issue. And the final recommendation that we pulled out of the, the survey was to explain more about the DMP review practices. The Commission has an internal assessment framework that's been developed in RAIA, the Research Executive Agency. And we recommend that that's endorsed and used throughout the Commission. And um, we've been doing some training courses with Commission project officers through the Foster Plus project. We recommend continuing those. There's been quite a, a demand internally for, for more help on how to review DMPs. And at the last, at the last session, we, we discussed developing some guidelines on how to do reviews and an FAQ on the practical implementation of the pilot. So I think those would be useful things to develop as internal resources. But in terms of the review, it's not just about what goes on within the Commission. It would also be useful to have a public statement on how the data management plans are being assessed and ideally release that assessment framework so people know, you know what they're going to be checked against. As I mentioned, there are a number of activities already going on that, that might help with some of these recommendations. So the Science Europe group has developed domain data protocols. These are essentially um, discipline specific guidelines or practices that could be adhered to um, when you're developing your DMPs. There are already a number of collections of example data management plans. Um, the DCC has a list, but there's also Rio Journal and Zenodo and Open Air. So there's lots of examples online that you can find. In terms of the RDM costs, there are already some existing guides, both from um, a Dutch um, Dutch group that coordinates RDM work called LCRDM. They've taken some UKDA guidelines and applied those to Horizon 2020 projects to think about actual what time and effort is needed to, on the various activities and how to how to cost that in. And the Wellcome Trust has guidelines in their data management um, requirements on the kind of things that are eligible costs. In terms of providing kind of drop downs and pulling um, different registry content into tools, there's been some work we've done on DMP online, integrating the metadata standards directory so researchers can find relevant metadata standards. Um, but other tools like Re3 Data could be plugged in as well. And there are working groups to try and develop common standards for data management plans. There's one that's set up recently through the RDA. And I think that will be a, a, a useful group for the Commission and others to engage with. And obviously, there'll, there'll be ongoing support from the Fair Data Expert Group and Open Air and others that can, can help the Commission as they continue to develop their guidelines. But this, 
webinar is not just about the, the commission and, and what they do. Um, there are obviously actions that all of us can take as a community, and we would encourage you to, to share your DMPs through whatever means. You can publish in journals like RIO or deposit in repositories like Zenodo or add them to the DCC list. And I think the really critical thing for, for all of us to do as a community is to continue to provide feedback on the pilot and what works for you, or particularly what doesn't work. The Commission really wants that feedback um, so that they can improve these guidelines and, and feed that into future developments. And whether you're coming from the kind of research community or the support side, I think it's really good to collaborate as you're developing your approach to DMPs and also feed your work into wider initiatives. So there are national open access desks in every country from open air, and there are international groups doing work in this area like the Research Data Alliance. So just a couple of concluding remarks and then we'll open up the questions. Um, obviously, there, there are lots of recommendations we've put forward to the EC here, um, but I don't want that to detract from the fact that the feedback overall in the survey was very positive. I think the community really likes the fact that there is this open data pilot and the, the fair data management plans. And for many, you know, they'd found the process of developing the DMP very positive and over half had found that the template was very useful too. And around a quarter of the ones who answered the question um, about improvements had said that they'd no, had no issues following the EC guidelines. So clearly a lot of what's there already is working, but as with anything, there's always room for improvement. And there were various suggestions made um, about how we could maybe iterate those guidelines and provide more support. As I mentioned, the EC has been asking for feedback and they've already iterated their guidelines. So they started with you know, the open data pilot, they expanded that to more areas. And I think the move to now introduce you know, fair data management is to try and respond to some of the concerns researchers had at the outset about not being able to open their data. So obviously they want the data to be as open as possible, as closed as necessary, but this introduction of fair is to really stress the, the benefits of managing data and, and sharing it in a way that makes it reusable to others. I think further updates are likely. Um, so the Fair Data Expert Group has been asked to advise on revisions to the template and also to, to think about the development of discipline specific guidelines. So I think these are things that are likely to, to happen, but I'm sure the EC will reflect on the, the other kind of outcomes and suggestions from the survey. So just to, to leave you on this slide where you can find out more, as I mentioned at the start, all of the materials on Zenodo so we've got the full survey report, as well as the raw data and the, the analysis we did, and our infographic. And Ellen and I um, are here presenting today, but there were five co-authors. So just to acknowledge our, our other co-authors, Marianne Kurtfeld from DANS, Emily Hermans, who's also here and, and can answer questions with us, and Eliana van Kalsa. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and I know various questions have come in in the chat box. So I think what we'll do now is, is just kind of open the floor to, to those questions. So Gwen, do you want to give us a or shall I just look from the Google Doc? So there was one pre preliminary question just asking if the presentation will be made available, and, and it will. Um, that will be available with the webinar recording at the end. We'll circulate that to all the participants and post it online. OK, I can see this. these have been put up now. I jumped to the Google Doc. So the, the second question, hopefully the participants can see this document as well. Um, isn't the 74% disagree score on I don't understand fair contradictory to the observation I made at the start that terms are, are unclear? And it is. Um, this is one of the things we found within the survey. I think at a high level, people do understand fair, but there's different conceptions about what fair means. And I think when it comes to putting that into practice and talking about how you'll make your data accessible, interoperable, reusable. Um, people sometimes struggle about, about how they're going to do that. And they had some issues with some of the terminology. 
And there were, I noticed at the start when, when Ellen was speaking, there were a number of links shared in the chat um, about some fair metrics work and about new papers that are coming out from the group who originally conceived this idea of fair. So the, the fair data and fair metrics um, question, I think, was answered in the chat. Um, so the fair metrics are really just a way to assess how fair data are. Um, and that's a new paper that's coming out. And then the next question, I'm going to hand this over to, to Ellen. Is there any breakdown about willingness to publish a DMP along the lines of support and researchers? Um, I don't know whether we're able to differentiate those from the results? Yeah, I I think we did, but there was not a real um, difference between them. But um, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't have it now. At, at the, we, we tried to do that in several other occasions. And uh, then uh, when there was a difference, clear difference between the two, then we mentioned it in the report. But uh, I don't know oh, if okay. we... Okay, so for this question. Okay, so we should be able to track the the results to identify who, which you know, how many had come from researchers or from support staff, and as as we mentioned, all the data is on Zenodo. So by all means, download the data set, and you'll hopefully be able to um, identify that. But I, I assume there wasn't that much of a difference because it's not something we flagged specifically. Uh, and then the next question, I guess, is for me, are there any plans on making the DMP online template more interoperable um, to allow smooth integration of info from local systems or vice versa? Um, yes, definitely. This is something that's one of the key priorities for us. Um, we want to enable data exchange across systems and allow people to, to push information in from local research systems. Um, the Common Standards Group that's, that's running through RDA will adopt whatever they develop, um, so that will also help with interoperability in, in future too. The question about good examples for DMPs, um, I think, was was answered in the chat. Um, there is a list on the DCC website, which is linked to there, but there are others as well. So in the Rio um, Rio Journal, um, the links there are a few hyperlinks in the slides that you can follow. Um, so I think there's probably about 15 DMPs that have been published in Rio, and there are lists from other groups as well. Um, the guidelines state that the Horizon 2020 template is not mandatory and that other templates can be used instead if all the main topics are covered. Does anyone have experience with that? Um, so we've had one answer in the chat already, Falco, um, no, sorry, that was Falco who had asked it, I think. Um, somebody said that while they're in Brussels, they were told the Horizon 2020 template is not mandatory. Um, but the agencies actually examine the incoming DMPs using the Horizon 2020 template. Um, so my understanding here, the, the template isn't mandatory, um, but I think it's advisable to use it or at minimum to make sure that you cover all of the same elements because the assessment framework, um, although that's at the moment, it's been developed by RAYA, it's just being used internally in RAYA. Um, it potentially will be used more broadly across the Commission. Um, and I think since that's the way they're assessing them, it's sensible to try and follow that same structure just so that it's easier for people to evaluate your plans. But the template itself isn't mandatory. You can use um, other templates. Um, the experience with that, we have actually had a help desk inquiry through DCC where somebody had used another template and they'd been told by their project officer they were using the wrong one. Um, so I think the response you know, can be variable. It's not officially um, mandatory to use it, but sometimes people get different advice on that. So it's probably safest to go with it unless you've got a strong opinion another way. Um, and then the question about the six month stage here, I'm guessing that was related to, to comments I made as I was talking. Um, at the moment, with the easy approach to DMPs, they're required at month six. 
and then are updated as as necessary throughout the the course of the project so this is why i mentioned six months stage because the dmp isn't needed at the grant application stage like with other funders Um, was there a question about asking if filling in a DMP would change the behaviour of researchers? Um, I don't think we did ask a question like that. No? Ellen shaking her head. We we asked them about their attitude to responding to Horizon 2020. Do you want to come in on that, Ellen? Sorry, I thought you were going to say something. No, I, I, the only thing I would like to mention is that there were so many comments on uh, on many questions, and they were also in the line of this um, um, of this question. So and we didn't directly ask it, but there were a lot of responses in the comments that uh, about this. So. Yeah, I was actually surprised in that first question about whether people find it a positive or negative experience. I was surprised how many of the comments in that talked about having approached it with a negative mindset, you know, thinking it was just going to be administrative. And lots of people had said about actually how it had made the project reflect and they found benefit that they weren't really anticipating. So whether it changes their practice is another step further, but um, I think the process themselves, they'd found useful so far. Um, how do we provide feedback to the EC? I mean, there isn't really, aside from having run this survey, there isn't really a formal mechanism. But what I would recommend is, is talking to your project officer. So, you know, when you're part of the pilot, sharing your experiences so that they know what's working or what's not. Obviously, you can um, share information through open air, through your no, no ads, um, or also to the Fair Data Expert group. Um, and we can try and feed it back through those mechanisms as well. But part of the reason why we ran this survey was, was specifically because the community had asked how they could feed back. So this was one mechanism for doing that. And the discipline that re researchers were from, um, I don't think we, we asked that. No? Ellen's? No, it was, it was in the responses. Right. Um, but we couldn't link uh, this to the answers. Uh, so mm. it was not uh, set up properly, I think, in the survey to make sure that we could uh, split it uh, per, per discipline. Yeah. Um, yeah, so question two, you'll see if you look at the survey report has been removed because that was where people identified who they were and the organization they were from. So some, sometimes people have flagged their discipline, but um, we'd agree to anonymize the results. Um, and has anyone got experience with discipline specific templates um, with guidance? Uh, so, so there is some being developed, as I mentioned, the domain protocols by Science Europe. And I know some universities within the UK have discipline specific guidance that they've developed, um, you know, within certain schools where they've got local support staff. Um, but I think that there isn't enough of that. Um, often funders have one template um, and they have a set of guidelines that go with it. And for funders like the EC that, that cover a broad range of disciplines, you know, it's it's fairly generic, and I think this is why sometimes people want something that's much more specific to their research area. But if you look at some of the funders like Wellcome or other health funders, obviously the guidance there is more tailored to, to that subject area. We did try to develop a guidance. And then from Marte. The social, so. So, so. Oh, okay. So oh, from I think Dan's. there's a delay there. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a SESTA uh, project um, uh, last year where we developed uh, uh, yeah. uh, a guide. Uh, I left the, the link in the chat box, but it's specific for the social sciences, just as an example. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you if you look at some of the um, kind of community infrastructures, the, the ERICs like SESTA, you'll find there are more kind of subject specific resources. Um, and then Marta has a question. Um, 
if a DMP is only completed at month six in the project, isn't it an, an issue for costing? It absolutely is. Um, they can't ask for more costs within the DMP, um, which is why we're recommending that some questions are included in the application stage around costs. Um, so at the moment, I mean, I, I guess the only fix projects could have if they come to month six, write their DMP and find that they have costs, like if they're planning to deposit in a repository and there's going to be a cost levied because they have a large amount of data, they would need to try, try and find the resources from somewhere within their project, which means cutting something else or, you know, changing their plans somehow. Um, so this is why we think it's, it's best that that's raised at the application stage so that any costs are included then. At the moment, the timing really doesn't work well. And in Rob Hoft mentions that in RDA, there's been a birds of a feather group addressing the inconsistency and non repeatability of these kind of questionnaires. And that makes results hard to use to verify the effects of policy decisions. Um, so uh, I guess so it's about trying to uh, synthesize things across funders. I know Science Europe, um, they've actually got a workshop happening at the end of the month um, that's about funders policies and approaches to data data management to try and get more co coherence across the approaches. Um, so that could be a useful thing to reflect on in that, that group. Um, and Rob, if you, if you want to say more about the group, um, by all means, add more in the chat as well. And do we know if there's a consensus on how the DMPs will be monitored in time throughout the project and whether there'll be sanctions whenever DMPs are not followed? So at present, um, the monitoring happens uh, via the project offices because the DMP is a deliverable. Um, so they're checked at the six month stage and then um, whenever there are project reviews. Sometimes the Commission brings in external reviewers and sometimes it will be the project officer themselves that, that look at the DMP. Um, when we've run training courses in the Commission, you know, people have asked about sanctions. Um, I think given that this is a pilot, um, it's, you know, it's not full policy yet and things take time to bed in, they're not going to be very strict on sanctions yet, but it's the kind of thing that tightens up over over time. So, so I think in the longer term, that is more likely, but I think at the moment there's there's a fair bit of, of leniency and really what they're looking for is a best effort response from, from projects. Uh, obviously, if a project says they'll deposit and then, you know, just refuses to do that in the end and there's not a good reason, um, then maybe the project officer will follow up and, and potentially in future there'll be sanctions, but I'd be surprised if there's any, like, quite yet. Um, I'm just going to scroll down again. The questions have jumped. Um, and Sophie Hu asks um, that she's wondering if researchers have given feedback regarding creating the DMP at the beginning of the proposal instead of the six month point. Um, there were definitely some comments about the timing of the DMP um, and overall, I mean, there were, there were different views throughout the survey. Um, overall, people like the fact that it was within the project rather than at the application stage. Um, some had thought the six month point was too early for certain aspects, but overall it was generally felt to be okay. Um, I think within uh, Horizon 2020, some people do provide some information at the proposal as well. There is an optional data management section that can be completed, which is similar to a DMP. So sometimes people fill it in there. Um, but I'm trying to think about other comments that came out of the survey. If there's any you remember and want to reflect on, Ellen? I think it's mainly uh, what I would share is, is, is what you mentioned also already before, that the costing aspect, that it would be um, good if people would have more ideas about how, how, much, pe how much things would cost uh, as a... Um, stage when they applied for a project instead of when the project starts because they could still uh, ask for funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not about yeah. creating a DMP, but it's DMP just, related in fact. 
Yeah, I think it's definitely useful to to flag some things at the proposal stage. Uh, it helps projects, you know, to think early on. And when we've been asked by certain projects about whether they should fill in that optional form, we've always recommended it. If the, you know, if data is a component of their project, it's helpful to consider the things early, and then that also gives you a, essentially a preliminary draft of your DMP for month six, something that you can then flesh out a bit further once you get to that deliverable. Um, I just noticed that Anders has put in the chat that he's heard of one of the projects where payments were held back because of a missing DMP. Um, so I think, you know, because these are deliverables, that there can be sanctions. Um, so yeah, it's definitely worth complying and filling them in. Um, and in terms of the metadata or metadata standards compulsory, I find this very complex to provide, um, Maria's mentioning. Um, so the standards are, are recommended, but the Commission acknowledges that there aren't standards in every field. So I think from recollection, the question says something like, um, if there aren't metadata standards, please describe what you'll capture. So they're looking for an explanation of, of the information that will be collected instead. Uh, just trying to scan through if there are other questions. But the the time frame for updates, um, the guidelines suggest that the DMP should be updated um, as applicable to the project. So um, when things change with the data, so there might be a change in terms of uh, which data should be shared or whether they're able to share data or they might change um, plans on what data will be created or how. So the DMP should be updated then. Um, but it says kind of at minimum at the review time. So so when people are, um, <laughs> sorry, I see Paula means the update of the DMP template rather than the update of the DMP itself. Um, I don't know that there are time frames from that. We've only just delivered this report to the EEC, so I think they need a bit of time to, to look and reflect. Um, but um, yeah, probably, I guess, sometime summer or maybe later this year, and there might be updates to the template. But that's something we'll, we'll definitely uh, let you know what we hear back on. So I just noticed the time as well. We're two minutes to two. Um, so we've, we've filled up the rest of the webinar with questions. Um, if there's any that we've missed, by all means, uh, repaste it in the chat if you want a quick answer. Scrolling through, it looks like we've we've captured most of them. So so hopefully you've you've heard back. Okay. Yeah, I think so too. So please have a look so at what the I, board. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looks like it. People are saying Yeah. And people are saying thank you as well. So hopefully we've covered everything you were looking for. Um, by all means, take a look at the report and, and share information back. Um, and thank you all for attending. Goodbye. Goodbye.